Thank you, David. Well, it's a uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, to to speak at uh, at this seminar. And uh, I like the idea of lunch seminar because you know even if you don't like the seminar, at least you enjoy your lunch. So and uh, everything smells good. So bon appetit, bon appetit, and you know I hope I don't I don't distract you too much from uh, from eating. But um, I represent here. Uh, a, a program on uh, non-perturbative effects and dualities in quantum field theory and uh, integrable systems. And I am a mathematician. My name is Edward. Hi, my name is Edward, and I'm a recovering mathematician. So, um, and so what I'd like to talk about today is, you know, our program is uh, really a, a synthesis of math and physics and the interplay between the two. And I want to talk about some of the aspects of both and how they inter interact with each other. So since I am a mathematician, I will start with some mathematics. Uh, I will start with some 17th century mathematics, uh, six, uh, 1637 to be precise. French mathematician Pierre Fermat. Left a note on a, on a, on a, very, on a, on a book, on a very good book at that. It was a Diophantus Arithmetica from the third century, I suppose, which gave the start to all what we call now Diophantic equations. So he left a note on the margin of that book saying that he found a remarkable proof of a remarkable fact that the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n has no integer solutions. x, y, z, provided that n is greater than 2. Unfortunately, he wrote, this margin is too narrow to contain this remarkable proof. So this is what I think of as a 17th century equivalent of a, of a Twitter proof. You know, so you, you tweet, I found, I found the remarkable proof of this fact. It's too bad that Twitter only allows me 140 characters. And so. But you know, this, this was a great idea because, of course, the people took this as a challenge. So that Fermat found this beautiful proof. So we should also go out and try to replicate it. And this search was on for more than 350 years until, until this, this result was finally proved. Was the, the, the challenge was settled by uh, Andrew Wiles and uh, Richard Taylor in uh, 1994. So that's. That's the first. That's the first bit. And um, <coughs> next, I want to talk about something that about 19th century physics. So 1861 or 62. James Clerk Maxwell. Writes his equations for electromagnetism, and these are beautiful differential equations describing electric and magnetic fields, usually denoted as E and B. And then uh, you look at these equations, and uh, one, of the th one of the things you quickly realize are very symmetrical. So in fact, there is a, there's a beautiful symmetry of these equations, which is essentially interchanges the two fields, the electric and magnetic fields. E goes to B, and B goes to negative E. And the equations remain the same. So electromagnetic duality. So the question I want to pose, which was the title of this talk, is what, what do these two results, do these two phenomena have in common? And the answer is given in terms of a 21st, 21st century mathematics and physics. Mathematical physics, exactly the kind of mathematical physics that we are exploring here at this program at KITP. And it roughly goes like this. So on the physics side, you have this electromagnetic dual duality. Here I talk about this electromagnetic duality for classical field theory, classical electromagnetism described by Maxwell equations. There is also quantum theory of electromagnetism, which is an example of what we know as uh, a Young-Mills theory, as a gauge theory. And, um, uh, electromagnetism is a gauge theory with the simplest gauge group, with the simplest gauge group, which is a circle or U1. The abelian 
the simplest abelian compact Lie group. We also know that there are important gauge theories which have non-abelian gauge groups. Non-abelian gauge groups. So for, for example, the standard model. In the standard model, this non-abelian gauge theory plays a very important role. So the question was posed in the 70s as to whether electromagnetic duality traced to the quantum, to the, to the quantum level also has an analog for non-abelian gauge theories. And an answer was proposed, which is now known as S-duality. Namely, it was suggested that um, gauge theories with non-abelian gauge groups have a, a very a mysterious equivalence, mysterious equivalence which generalizes the electromagnetic duality. So that's around uh, 19, 1970. So remarkable aspect of this S duality was that the gauge group under this, under this duality, the gauge group, gets replaced by another group, which is called a dual group. And um, so there was always this big question as to why, why, why this happens and what the meaning of the dual group is in the physics context. On the other hand, in parallel, uh, here we start with, with, with Fermat's last theorem. Last theorem. And of course, what, what, uh, what Wiles and Taylor proved was not exactly the Fermat's last theorem. It was a different result, which was earlier shown to imply Fermat's last theorem. And that result is, is known as the Tanyama, Tanyama Shimo Vey conjecture. Now called now theorem, also known as the modularity theorem. This connection, this link, was made by Fry and and and, uh, and Ribet in the 80s. The Tanyama Shimura Vey conjecture itself can be viewed as a very special case of what's called the Langlands program. Special case of the Langlands program. And the Langlands program, in turn, can be formulated in the, in, the, in the realm of geometry. So maybe I'll call it the geometric Langlands program. And this was a lot of work in this direction in the 90s, to the last 10 years. And so the crucial link finally came about five years ago which was the connection between S-duality and the appearance of the dual group here and the geometric Langlands program in which the Langlands dual group also appears. So this is a, this is a work of, of uh, uh, which started with the work of a physicist Kapustin Witten, Kapustin Witten, and has been continued by, by many others and has already led to a lot of interesting insights into both physics and mathematics and in particular led to our to our workshops here at KITP starting in 2008. So that's the brief outline. That's what electromagnetic duality and Fermat's last theorem have in common. They have in common the fact that they both can be viewed as part of the Langlands duality or the Langlands program. So now I would like to talk a little bit more about this and, and also to talk about what physics brings into this picture, the insights that physics brings into this picture and how it helps us to unravel some of the closely related mathematics, which perhaps eventually in the future will help us to prove many more results uh, like this without giving any excuses that the margin or the blackboard is too small to contain it. <coughs> so first of all, I want to tell you a little bit about this Langlands program. Langlands is a mathematician. <coughs> at the Institute for Advanced Study. And perhaps an interesting aspect is that he occupies the office, uh, which was formerly occupied by Albert Einstein at the Institute. So also kind of a crossing between physics and math, if you think about it. So now, how does, how does the Fermat's last theorem fit this broad and general Langlands program? I want to talk about this Tanya Mashimura Bay conjecture, which really is 
what implies what implies Fermat's last theorem. And Tanya Shimura Vey conjecture is about the study of elliptic curves. Tanya Shimura Vey conjecture. Is about the study of elliptic curves. An elliptic curve, of course, over the complex field is something that we can draw very easily. It's, it's simply a torus. From the point of view of algebraic geometry, we can describe such a curve by an equation. So we'll write something like this y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And if you are a and b are complex numbers, and you look for solutions, so these are fixed. And x and y are the two variables, so you look at solutions, <coughs> x and y, then you will get precisely uh, a Riemann surface like this, if you, well, uh, per perhaps uh, safe for the, for the point at infinity. But what, when you study number theory, it is also interesting to, uh, to look at solutions of such equations uh, which are the integer solutions. So let, let's assume let's assume that they're fixed and they're integers. And so then we look at the set of solutions of this equation, uh, which are also integral solutions. But we can relax the condition a little bit and look at solutions modulo some prime number, mod p, where p is a prime. So in other words, we just look at, at the numbers at integers x and y, which solve this equation, but so that the left and right hand side differ by multiple of, of, of a given prime. So for, for each prime, we'll then give, get a, a certain number of solutions. And plus, we'll, we'll add the point at infinity, infinite point. So this will be. Uh, this set of solutions you can think of as a kind of a shadow of the same of the same elliptic curve, which we can visualize so nicely uh, over the complex numbers. But this will be a shadow of that elliptic curve, which we look at now uh, in the arithmetic modulo p. So these numbers are very important because they carry a lot of interesting number theoretic information. And the question is, what are these numbers? And is there, is there some underlying general principle which allows us to express all of them at once? Is there a nice generating function, for example, which will carry all of this, all of these numbers all at once? And that's the subject, that's the statement of the Tanya Amashimur Vey conjecture. Tanya Amashimur Vey conjecture relates these numbers to, to objects of a totally different nature, which live in the world of analysis, namely to modular forms on the upper half plane. So, so now we enter the world of analysis, or harmonic analysis, to be a little more, more precise. So we have the upper half plane, all complex numbers such that the imaginary part is greater than zero. And we'll, we will use, a, um, we, we have an action on this upper half plane of the group S L to Z. Two, two by two matrices, dominant one, and the action is simply that tau goes to a tau plus b divided by c tau plus d. In particular, one of the special cases of such a transformation is the transformation tau goes to negative one over tau, for example. And so there is these objects which are called modular forms modular forms, they are essentially functions, functions on the upper half plane, which have favorable transformation properties under the action of this group, which essentially invariant under, under the action of this group, maybe invariant up to multiplying by some simple factor. So the statement of the Tanyama, Tanyama Shimura conjecture is that to, to each elliptic curve like this, which I'll call E, you can naturally associate a modular form, Fe. And we can write this modular form in a, in a Fourier series. And the natural parameter for the Fourier series would be Q, which is E to the 2 pi i tau. 
So we can write this as a sum of b n q to the n. n to one to two. And it will be, in fact, what's called a cusp form. So the constant coefficient will vanish. There will be no b0. It will start with b1. And uh, the constant coefficient at tau equal plus i infinity, and, uh, which is where we're doing the expansion now. And uh, we'll normalize it so that b1 is equal to 1. So now it's, it's normalized. And so the statement is that this Fe is going to have a very nice property with respect to the action of this modular group. In fact, it will be what's called a modular form of weight 2. Of weight 2 with respect to a certain congruent subgroup. In other words, it will have favorable properties, not with respect to all transformations, but a certain subgroup thereof. <coughs> but this is a technical detail. The most important fact is that this is there's this analytic object, which is essentially, think of it as a generating function of some numbers, of some integers. And the remarkable fact is that those numbers AP, the numbers of solutions of this Diophantian equation, this equation mod P, can actually all be found, all save, finitely many, save for finitely many of those which divide the discriminant of this, of the, of the right-hand side. All of them, except perhaps for finitely many, can be found as a coefficient of this modular form. So I want you to appreciate the, the, um, the magnitude of this, of, this, of this statement. I mean, on the objects of totally different nature. Here we have number theory. Here we study some equations and in integers. Here we study analysis, and we look at some analytic functions which have some very peculiar properties. And it turns out that all of these numbers, which appear at first glance as totally transcendental, so to be, to, be, to be absolutely precise, I should write p plus 1 minus AP. It's a number of solutions so that really have this equality. Uh, totally transcendental uh, in nature. Because if you try to do on the computer to calculate these numbers, you will see that they behave in a very strange way. And yet all of them turn out to be coefficients of one and the same uh, analytic function. So that's a, remarkable, that's a remarkable conjecture to make. How good does one even come up with this, with this stuff? Right? So, and um, that, that result, that conjecture, implies Fermat's theorem because an, an elliptic curve, which, which has these properties called modular, and the conjecture is that all elliptic curves are modular. That's the statement of the Tanyama Shimura way conjecture. So the idea of Fry, which was then later confirmed by Fribit in the 80s, was that um, if you have a solution of Fermat's equation, we want to prove that there are no integer solutions of Fermat's equation. If there were a solution, it would give us an elliptic curve which would not have this property, for which we wouldn't be able to find such a modular form. So if we knew the statement of Tanyam, if we know the statement of the Tanyam Shimorvei conjecture, we then obtain Fermat's last theorem. And uh, Wiles and Taylor have in fact proved Tayama Shimura Vey conjecture for so-called semi-stable elliptic curves, which was enough for these purposes, and that was eventually generalized to all elliptic curves. What's the meaning of other coefficients of this form? So, the, in fact, they, you have, they have multiplicative property. So if you have B of M times N, where M and N are relatively prime, it's equal to the product of the two. So these coefficients corresponding to the primes, in fact, determine the whole thing. Yeah. So, and now, so what, what kind of statement is the Tanyam Shimurve conjecture? Well, that can be put in a very broad context of the Langlands program. And um, could you could you explain more why this? Hmm? How does it link? If you I understand, why can't you have a modular form? There, there are some there are some pro, it, it's some pro, yeah it's not, it's not in one line explanation but yeah so if um, if there is a solution, then it would imply that the corresponding elliptic, then you construct, you write down explicitly what a, a certain a and b, which are um, obtained from the solution of the Fermat, of a would-be solution of the Fermat equation, and then you look at this elliptic curve and you see that it's not modular, which we now know is impossible. That's why the solution didn't exist in the first place. Yes? But, um, so the a, b there is not, uh, in particular, the AB of the right. No, yeah, that's right. So that was now, not a good. The reason I ask is, is, is how am I? Um, uh, but, but, um, I, I suppose that equivalence to me right now seems almost. I'm not sure. You know, if you told me go, go to, 
you know, go to a computer or start computing. Here's an AB on the left, here's an AB right. on the right. Suppose you could compute all of this guy. So that, here's another way to think about it. So, suppose you, you knew all these numbers, right? So you knew all the, you compute all these numbers somehow. So then you, you create this function out of those numbers. And I explained that, well, the, the, the ones which have the prime coefficients are just the ones you know. And the others you obtain by multiplicative property. So you create this infinite series. Oh, so, but a priori, it's just some form of our series which has no, no, uh, no interesting properties, right? But it turns out that this, 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 this uh, is a Fourier expansion of a function on the upper half plane, which is modular, so for, which has this properties, which is essentially invariant under this transformation. So that's the remarkable, that's the remarkable fact. But in fact, it's more, it's better to think in the opposite way because it's much easier to find those guys than to find, to f compute those numbers, right? And um, because now we are in the realm of analysis. In analysis, how do we find functions? Maybe it satis here it satisfies some functional relations because it's invariant under this group. It also satisfies differential equations. So there are many, many different ways to find, to pin down this function. And then once you have it, you have all of those numbers at once. So what, what kind of statement is it? I mean, what, what is the mechanism which allows you to connect number th questions in number theory of Diophantian equations of this type to analysis on, say, on upper half plane? Well, Langlands put this in this very broad context, and he explained that. I'm sorry? Tanya Mashimura? Well, how much time do I have? <laughs> Two hours? <laughs> so I'll, maybe I'll talk about it later. Uh, you know. They just satisfy the same functional equation. And, uh, they were, yeah, there were there was all kinds of evidence, I suppose, but. Yeah, perhaps I shouldn't get too much into second guessing them right now. So anyway, what I want to say is that I want to emphasize that this is this looks like a, a freaky uh, coincidence, but in fact it's not. It is actually part of a very broad and very mysterious connection between number theory and harmonic analysis, which is called the Langlands program. The link between number theory and harmonic analysis. So it's a very special case, in fact, of such a, of, of its very general and very broad link, which was envisioned by Langlands. And in, 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 first in his letter that he wrote to Andre Vey in, in, in 1967. And what he explained is that <coughs> actually the way we want to think about this is that on the left-hand side, we look at what's called the Galois group. Bala group of Q over Q of Q bar over Q. Q stands for the field of rational numbers, all the fractions of integers, of relatively prime integers, right? And algebraic closure means that we throw in all the roots of all polynomials in one variable that you can write with rational coefficients. This is a very this is a very large field which contains the field of rational numbers, and we can look at the group of automorphisms of automorphisms of this, of this field. That's a Galois group. And what we want to do is we want to study representations of this Galois group. So n-dimensional, not the same n, dimensional representations of the Galois group. one side. And Langland's idea was that this should be linked to what's called automorphic representations. Automorphic representations <coughs> of GLN, of the group GLN. So it's the same N as this one. N-dimensional representation of Galois group. Automorphic representation of GLN. And uh, that they should be linked. That they should, they should be linked between the two. And um, the elliptic curve, this picture gives rise to a two-dimensional, two-dimensional elliptic curve gives rise to a two-dimensional representation. This is not obvious, but it becomes, it becomes somewhat obvious if you look at this picture. So this is an elliptic curve over the complex field. So this is a familiar Riemann surface. We know that it has two, two inequivalent cycles, uh, this one and, and this one. A cycle and the B cycle. 
So together, they span what's called the, the first homology of this curve, or because everything is self-dual in this case, you can also think of it as the first cohomology of this curve, H1. So these complex coefficients. Now we are talking about an elliptic curve defined over the rationals. But in that world, there is its own cohomology theory, which you can, uh, which you can construct, which is called the tal cohomology. And it has, in many ways, properties which are very similar to the traditional topological cohomology that we talk about here. In particular, the first etal cohomology of this elliptic curve is also two-dimensional, also two-dimensional. And because the curve is defined over the rationals, whatever symmetries you have of the algebraic closure are going to act on this vector space. So you get a natural representation of the Galois group on this two-dimensional space. What about those numbers? Those numbers of solutions could be recovered from this representation alone. So you don't need to, to look at the numbers of solutions of the equations. You can just look at this Galois representation. It captures all the information about the elliptic curves that we need. In particular, these numbers AP are contained in here. And on the other side, this modular form Fe of tau is something which gives rise to, to an automorphic representation of GL2 is an automorphic representation of GL2. And this, this has to do with the fact that the upper half plane can itself be written as a quotient of SL2R by, by SO2. So that there is an action, there is an action of the group SL2R on the space of, 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 of this function on the, on the upper half plane. I'm not going to get into too much detail. But I, I hope it's clear that roughly speaking, the elliptic curve of the Tanya Amashimura con uh, way conjecture gives us an object on this side for n equal 2. And the modular forms gives us an object on the right-hand side also for n equal 2. And the fact that there is a link between them is part of this very general principle, which is called the Langlands correspondence or the Langlands program. So, so this correspondence, the way, the way I explain it here, it really hinges upon the group GLN. So this is an algebraic group. So what is GLN? GLN consists of all n by n matrices, yeah, with which are invertible, so with non-zero determinant. So this is an example of what's called a reductive algebraic group. But then there are many other reductive algebraic groups, right? There are there is SLN, for example. There are orthogonal groups. There are symplectic groups, and there are those also weird uh, uh, groups. Uh, um, uh, which are called, uh, which are, which are called, you know, E6, E7, E8, and uh, uh, G2 and F4, right? Uh, special, uh, special, uh, special, uh, <coughs> simple, simple algebraic groups. So whenever in mathematics, whenever you have you have some result which concerns GLN, which is in some ways the simplest reductive algebraic group, you always wonder what will happen if you replace GLN by a general reductive algebraic group. For example, orthogonal or symplectic. And a very remarkable thing happens if you do that here. In, uh, in the formulation for GLN, you get n-dimensional representations of the Galois group. What is an l-dimensional representation? It's the same as a map to GLN. So you might expect that if you replace GLN on this side by some group G, like orthogonal or symplectic, you would have to replace here also by the same group. But in fact, you have to replace by a different group. And that's what, that's what is now known as a Langlands dual group. And that's exactly the group that appears also in S-duality, which was the first indication that the two subjects might, might and perhaps should somehow be connected. So now I move over to the, to the physics side, and I talk a little bit about S-duality the appearance of the Langlands dual group here, there, and then I will talk about how to connect the two. So LG is the Langlands dual group. Dual group. I mean, I should give a couple of examples. If, the, if your original group is GLN, the dual group is also GLN. So you, you, don't, you kind of don't detect it right away if you work in this context, the way the first approximation to the Langlands program that I wrote. But for instance, if you take SLN, it's already, this dual is SLN divided by the cyclic group, the center. And perhaps more, 
uh, a more stunning uh, duality is if you take an old orthogonal group, then uh, you're going to get a symplectic, and, and so on. So it's a very, it's a very non-trivial operation on reductive algebraic groups, and the fact that this appears here is an indication that this can't be something simple. That this correspondence, this connection, must be profound, must be, must follow from something very, very, very sophisticated. So, can we see that happening in physics? So on the physics side, we start with, I, I, we start with a non-abelian generalization of the electromagnetic duality. So here we talk about this S duality, which I have already mentioned. And so S duality has to do with a four-dimensional, four-dimensional, supersymmetric, supersymmetric gauge theory. In fact, we look at the maximally supersymmetric gauge theory in four dimensions, the one which is called n equal four. So this theory is, a, is, a, is about the study of connections on a four manifold, let's call it M4, four dimensional manifold. And we study bundles with connection on this four dimensional manifold, which give us the gauge fields of the gauge, of the gauge theory. And then there are some additional fields, which are the super partners of these gauge fields. So there is a parameter then, there is a group, there's a compact Lie group. There's a compact Lie group, this is a gauge group of the theory. And uh, I'll be a little bit sloppy because in this discussion, my group was a complex Lie group like GLN. And now I will talk about compact Lie groups like SUN. But perhaps for the purpose of this seminar, this not, the difference is not so essential. So I could, I could put a, um, a little index C to indicate it's compact, but perhaps I shouldn't overload it but with notation. So let's just say, let's use the same notation G for it. There is also one more parameter, which is a coupling, which is a complexified coupling constant, tau which combines the theta angle and the coupling constant of the theory. So you say in the, in the, in the, in the case when G is U1, if we were uh, uh, working in a usual uh, U1 gauge theory, not supersymmetric, usual U1 gauge theory, uh, with some, with, with uh, electrons, then E would be, would be the electric charge. G, G would be E, the electric charge. <coughs> this is a generalization of the electric charge in a, in a, in a general uh, supersymmetric gauge theory. So I will, I will assume here that it is a sim simple, simple compact Lie group so that it, we only have one coupling constant. Uh, and theta is a theta angle. So the statement of S duality is the, the statement that two gauge theories associated to two different groups in general and two different coupling constants are equivalent to each other. And one of them is a group in which, is a theory in which the gauge group is G and the coupling constant is tau. And the other one is a, is a gauge theory in which the group is a Langlands dual group, the same Langlands dual that shows up in the Langlands correspondence in here. It also shows up in here. And the coupling constant minus one divided by tau. Note, for example, that let's say the theta angle is zero, then tau is four by i divided by g squared. So minus one over tau is essentially, uh, the transformation tau goes to minus one over tau is essentially the transformation which sends g to one over g. And that's perhaps the most remarkable aspect of this, of this S duality, because it links a weakly coupled theory for which the coupling constant is small to a strongly coupled theory for which the coupling constant is very large. 
and which is of course a very strong, very important result because it, it indicates that the non-perturbative nature of, of the four-dimensional gauge theory. As always, we, we usually write uh, various quantities by path integral, which we can which we then realize as a power series in the coupling constant. That power series converges at best when the coupling constant is very small. So then we have to know whether this is in fact uh, a power series expansion of an analytic function. The existence of such or conjecture that we, such a correspondence exists, such an equivalence exists, suggests that in fact the theory does exist beyond perturbation theory. And moreover, you can obtain results about strongly coupled theory by simply looking at the theory at small values of the coupling constant. So it's a very strong, very important result, conjecture, really. In the I have to say, in the abelian case, this can be proved by some manipulations, for example, with the path integral. So it's, a, it's fairly well understood and accepted in the abelian theory. Abelian theory being somewhat decorated uh, theory of, of quantum theory of Maxwell's electromagnetism. But in the non-abelian non case, this is still a big mystery. And of course, one of the, one of the elements of it which make it in, uh, so mysterious is the fact that the gauge group actually gets replaced by a different group. So why does the Langlands dual group appear in two different stories? One is the story of Galois representations and automorphic forms, which uh, includes, as a special case, tayam shimura Vey conjecture, and therefore Fermat's last theorem. And the other one is a, is a theory of S-duality in four-dimensional super young males. The answer uh, was suggested only about five years ago, originally in a paper by Kapustin and Witten. And the idea was that we can go from this S duality of four dimensional theory, four dimensional gauge theory, to a certain duality of two dimensional, of closely related two dimensional theories. Two dimensional means real two dimensional. So complex curves, for example, human surfaces would be a uh, natural playground for such two dimensional theories. And as you can probably see already that the Langlands correspondence, the way it's defined, it kind of lives in the world of, of, of curves, in the world of human surfaces, for example. And so it is not surprising that it will be closely linked to two-dimensional theory. But the idea is that the two-dimensional theory that one obtains, one, one gets it in the most natural way by looking at a, a four-dimensional n equal four super young males. So that was the idea of Kapustin and Witten. Idea. They said, let's look at a special case where uh, the, the four manifold, the four manifold on which our connections live, on which our theory lives, can be written as a product, as a product of two uh, of two Riemann surfaces. So each of them is two-dimensional, so the product is four-dimensional as we want two Riemann surfaces. <coughs> And then let's assume that the size, that, that uh, sigma is much bigger, much bigger than, than C, and take the limit when sort of C, sigma becomes infinitely big and C, then C remains small. So we get, get what's called an effective theory, quantum field theory, on sigma which knows something about C. And this theory is going to be two-dimensional. Two-dimensional theory. So, in fact, earlier, about 10 years before this work, um, this, this two-dimensional theory was identified as the so-called sigma model. The sigma model. with a target manifold. Manifold. The so-called Hitchin moduli space. So here I start with, with the gauge theory on the right. This one. It's a group, gauge group G and parameter tau. And uh, we do this dimensional reduction. We compactify on the, on the surface C. We get a sigma model 
Sigma model means that we are studying maps now from sigma to this moduli space. So what is this moduli space? This is a moduli space of what's called Higgs fields. This is where we have something in common, I guess, with a program on LHC, right? <laughs> you guys are looking for the Higgs boson, and we are looking for Higgs bundles, so, you know. <laughs> there is some similarity. Uh, in fact, of course, the reason why it's called Higgs bundle or Higgs field is, uh, is because it comes, it's a shadow, it's a two-dimensional shadow of a, of a, of a scalar field in a, in a four-dimensional gauge theory, so it's quite appropriate in some sense to call it a Higgs field or a Higgs bundle. But um, we'll see who finds uh, theirs first. <laughs> <laughs> so MH of G describes pairs um, like this, where P is what's called the principal G bundle over C now. So we have a model in which our space time, this space time is now sigma, the first factor of this decomposition. But the moduli space knows about, about C. And the way it knows about C is that C enters the definition. It's a moduli space of some objects on C. And these objects are, it's a principal G bundle. And phi is, is a section of of the twist of the Lie algebra bundle uh, and a tensor twist the canonical line bundle. And, but the best thing is the name, right? So that's why it's called the Higgs field. <laughs> so even if you don't know what this is, you know, you know, the, you, know what, you kind of know what this is. <coughs> so that's the target manifold for that theorem. But this is a theory which you got from one of the two theories connected by S duality, the one corresponding to G and tau. And what about the other one? The other one will give you MH of LG. Same thing, except now it's, you replace the group G by its dual. And so the S duality between this, the two gauge theories gives rise to a duality between the, th the two theories. I just write it schematically like this, maybe. Sigma 2 MH of LG. The two theories, whose two, two sigma models, two supersymmetric sigma models, maybe I should say it's a supersymmetric and equal two supersymmetric sigma model, two sigma models whose target manifolds are these Hitchin moduli spaces associated to the two to a pair of Langlands dual groups. And in fact, this S duality. Uh, was, it was argued even before Kapustin Witten, and this S duality between the two gauge theories <coughs> gives rise to, what's, to another beautiful duality in, in, in physics, which is called the mirror symmetry. But the decisive step in linking this picture to, to the Langlands correspondence was made by Kapustin and Witten. And their, their idea was that if you have two quantum field theories, and, um, which are equivalent, then everything you can say about one of them should have an analog on the other side. Which, by the way, in the electromagnetic duality, this is, of course, uh, 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 I talked about one aspect of it, which is the replacement of a coupling constant by its inverse. But another aspect is that sort of uh, electric properties of particle fields and so on get replaced under this duality but ma by magnetic properties. So for instance, under this duality, a particle carrying electric charge, like electron, will get replaced by a particle which carries magnetic charge, like magnetic monopole. So uh, likewise, in this picture of two-dimensional two -dimensional theory, various uh, objects on one, on one side will get replaced by uh, totally different objects on the other side. And uh, what Kapustin Witten suggested is that we should look at what this mirror symmetry does to what's called B brains. What does it do to B brains? To B brains. And of course, it's already done a lot to our, our brains, but you know. But in this case, and probably to your brains already, if you're here, seeing this for the first time. Now, B brains are this can be thought of as these two-dimensional shadows of boundary conditions in the in the four-dimensional super young mills, and they come in different flavors on on two sides because, in fact. 
I didn't tell you one important aspect of, of this, which is that we are looking at what's called the topological, topological field theory here. So we are, we are looking, even though we do expect that test duality is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is correct for the full-fledged quantum field theory, but we are looking at kind of a simplified version of this, of this theory, which is called topological field theory. And this topological field theory is, in addition, is twisted, which means that the action of the Lorentz group on um, on various fields is, is distorted so as to allow us to have to have a BRST charge which we use to define the topological field theory. This is the reason why the scalar Higgs field gets replaced by one form. So but the two twistings on two sides for things to work nicely actually have to be different. And one of the twist so the, the twist on one side gives rise to what's called you know, what's called an A model for those familiar with sigma models and on this side what's called a B model. And actually, the, the brains, the boundary conditions, they, they have different flavor in the two models. The most important thing about brains, to know about brains, is that uh, brains are objects of a category. So brains, brains form categories. So you will have a category of brains on this side. Because it's an A model, it will be called the category of A brain, A brains. And there will be a category on this side as well. And because it's a B model, they will be called B brains. When I see a problem, I should just say brains. And uh, because the two theories are equivalent, or we believe that they're equivalent under mirror symmetry, which is a trace of the, of the uh, S duality, we do expect that these two categories are equivalent to each other. And so the idea of Kapustin Witten was that this equivalence, in fact, this last equivalence can also be put in the context of the categorical language correspondence. In other words, to say it, to, to simplify slightly, this last equivalence of categories of the categories of brains is in fact the language correspondence. So let's call this E for equivalence. E is the language correspondence, the geometric or categorical language correspondence. So well, it's probably better to say a categorical. Well, there, are different, there are different flavors. It's a particular version of the categorical Langlands correspondence. So if you, if you have survived up to now, falling, falling, you might be wondering, what the hell do these things have to, brains have to do with, um, you know, Galois representations on this side and um, morph representations on that side, which is what I advertised as the main objects of the, of the <laughs> original Langlands correspondence. Well, there is a certain leap of faith. There is a certain analogy we have to make because the point is that we are moving from the from from the context in which from the context in which the Langlands program was originally invented, which is number theory, to geometry. We are moving to geometry, and we are moving, in fact, to complex geometry. So it is very much like uh, here on this side, studying, like I said at the very beginning studying this equation mod p. And when we move to the world of complex geometry, we will get this. We will get the elliptic curve. We will study solutions over the complex field. So that's what we are doing, roughly. We are moving the Langlands correspondence, which has been so instrumental, for example, in getting Tanya Amshimura, Weyer conjecture, and Fermat's last theorem. We are moving it to the realm of complex geometry, which roughly means that whenever you have some equation defined mod p, you are replacing it by the equation which is defined over the complex numbers. When you do that, the cast of characters has to change because certain things which, which appeared before do not have any obvious uh, analog uh, in, the, in the geometric world. And so what happens, in fact, is that instead of a correspondence, instead of a connection between, say, Galois representations and modular forms, which I talked about earlier, the most natural and satisfying way to formulate the Langlands correspondence in the, in the complex world is in terms of an equivalence of categories. So it becomes, the Langlands correspondence becomes, Langlands correspondence becomes an 
dynamic equivalence of categories. And equivalence of categories. Which categories would have to be for a dinner seminar or, I don't know, for a breakfast seminar? Uh, I will not go, I'm, I'm not going to tell you, but I urge you to all to go to the to the to the web page of our program and there are many resources there. So you can, if you're interested, you can read more and find the, the wonderful video videos of lectures that would, uh, me and that uh, you know our participants have have given and are still giving here at, at, at this conference. Um, I have a question from this. Yes. What is, what's a category? <laughs> what's a category? <laughs> okay. This is very important. I, yes, I maybe. We know what the brain is. <laughs> <laughs> a category is something which has, which uh, in which you keep track of of, of of symmetries of your objects. In other words, uh, usually it's the next level uh, uh, of generality for after sets. So a set is a collection of objects, and that and there's no connection between them. And a category is something which has which has a collection of objects. But then you also have morphisms. For any two objects, you have morphism between them. For instance, if you have object and you can look at morphisms from the object to itself, and these are the inner symmetries of the object. So going to categories from sets is like um, enhancing your structure in that you are now try starting to keep track of all the symmetries that your objects have. And one of the things that people have realized gradually in the geometric context is that in the geometric world, in the complex world, in fact, the most the most natural and satisfying formulation of this kind of result correspondences like the Langlands correspondence is inherently categorical. And at the same time, and perhaps in parallel, physicists have also realized that categories play an important role in quantum field theory. Because I mean first you start you, you study some functions, the correlation functions, what is a correlation function? It's a vector in a vector space, maybe it's or it's or it's, a, it's an object, it's an, it's an element of a set. But then people realize that in fact in quantum field quantum field theory also naturally accommodates categories. Unfortunately, not only categories, but also two categories, three categories, and so on. But in particular, it does accommodate categories. And these categories show up, for example, through the study of brains. So the remarkable suggestion, idea of Kapustin and Witten was that this equivalence of the two categories coming from mirror symmetry uh, is, in fact, uh, uh, which is a corollary of this S duality, is, in fact, a version of the geometric Langlands correspondence. And so that gives us sort of a physics perspective on uh, um, in this uh, connection between, say, uh, geometric analogs of, um, of the automorphic representations on this side, which are now, we think of them as A-brains, and the Galois representations on this side, which we think of as analogs of, um, of B-brains. So, but then, of course, the big question is, where does S-duality itself come from? Because so far we have left it mysterious. And it turns out that actually physicists only have an answer, or a sort of an answer. And uh, the answer involves a mysterious six-dimensional theory. And I would love to tell you more about this, but I'm afraid this blackboard is too small. <laughs> <laughs> All this information. So there is this mysterious six-dimensional quantum field theory, superconformal field theory, which of which we only know we, uh, because it, it shows up uh, in various ways in string theory and M theory. We know it's not Lagrangian, so we, we know bits and pieces about about this theory. But it is believed that this six-dimensional theory governs a lot of important phenomena, for example, in four-dimensional physics, in particular the S duality. Six-dimensional theory. A six-dimensional theory, you can compactify down to four dimensions by using a, a two-dimensional uh, piece. So writing your six-dimensional manifold as a product of a Riemann surface and a four, a four manifold. So in the first approximation, what you can do is, and one of the examples you can consider is, you can compactify on an elliptic curve. Elliptic curve with parameter with modular parameter tau, so it is just going to be c divided by z plus z tau, where tau is an element is a point in the upper half line. And so it is believed that this compactification gives us precisely the four-dimensional n, n equal four super Yagmel's theory. 
I should say that it's not just one theory, but there is one theory of each of the ADE types. And so there will be a corresponding gauge group G, which corresponds to one of those types. And so now the, the mysterious S duality becomes sort of a triviality, because we know that E tau is simply equal to E minus 1 over tau. And tau, this tau becomes the, becomes the coupling constant, the complexified coupling constant. So from the point of view of the four-dimensional <coughs> theory, this is a parameter, this is a coupling constant. But from the point of view of the six-dimensional theory, it is just a convenient way to write an elliptic curve. And the same elliptic curve will correspond to tau and negative 1 over tau. That's why the corresponding two quantifications have to be the same. This is in a simply laced case, ADE. But a slight generalization of this argument will also give you general S duality. So this is actually this actually turned out to be the beginning of a very beautiful story, which is one of the main stories that we are exploring here at, at this at this program here at KITP. And the question is, so if S duality and therefore Langland's program, Langland's correspondence, all come from compactifying this mysterious six-dimensional theory on an elliptic curve, what will happen if we compactify on an on a on a Riemann surface of a general genus. And it turns out that this way, we actually obtain a large class of a large class of four-dimensional gauge theories, which will also exhibit a whole plethora of dualities very similar and, and vastly generalizing the S duality. So we compactify on the general, maybe let's call it X, to be different from all other symbols that have used. General of the surface. And um, so this will be some four dimensional theory. And this four dimension between these four dimensional theories, we have some new duality. We might get some new and interesting duality. And of course, one can ask, what is the analog of this in mathematics? So the, perhaps the mathematical Langlands duality should also be generalized uh, to case of uh, general Riemann surfaces. So one note that I want to add uh, is that I talked about the work of Kapust and Witten. This um, connection between the Langlands program and S duality was a mystery for many years. And actually what helped to uh, break this mystery was a meeting uh, in uh, February of 2004 at, at Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Study where a small group of physicists and mathematicians met and, and brainstormed it. And at the end of the meeting, Edward Witten gave a talk and gave a broad outline of what the connection should be, something that I tried to explain to you uh, very briefly in this lecture. And um, so th we were very fortunate that that meeting was uh, was supported by, by DARPA, by, by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And DARPA has been very instrumental, actually, in supporting research in this area for the last, uh, what, seven years. And in fact, uh, we started a collaboration with KITP in 2008. We had the first meeting here, and I'm very grateful to and David, uh, David Gross for uh, also supporting this. So we had our meetings here every year since 2008. This is our fourth meeting on bringing together physicists and mathematicians. Uh, and I'm also very pleased to have here today in the audience Tony Falcon, uh, our manager at DARPA. So very grateful also to him and his predecessor, Ben Mann at DARPA for supporting this effort because I, I think that we've done, we've done pretty well and uh, uh, unraveled some of the mysteries. You know, uh, I hope you, I was able to give you some flavor, some ideas about the subject that we are studying. You know, um, Eugene Wigner wrote famously about um, unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and natural sciences. And I think, you know, every day is bringing us new surprises. And I hope that we'll have the opportunity to continue discussing all of this here at KITP. Thank you very much. Questions from outside the program. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Could you give an example of flavor what these uh, new 40 theories? Okay. These are going to be n equal, n equal 2 supersymmetric. Gauge theories. And in fact, uh, in general, they're going to have a quite complicated group and quite complicated matter content. 
and uh, both the gauge group and the matter content will be will correspond to a particular way of cutting a rimmed surface into uh, pairs of pens. So what do I mean by this? Uh, so let's say you have a rimmed surface like this, right? So what you can do is you can cut. You, you need to cut it into uh, into the simplest possible pieces, right? So for example, you can cut here. And then what? Uh, you can cut here, and you can cut here, for example. And in general, there are going to be many ways, right? So when you cut, you <coughs> decompose your human surface into these basic blocks, which are called pair of pens, right? And so for each decomposition into pair of pens, you are supposed to have, uh, um, uh, when you compactify your theory on the human surface, and you look at this human surface, which is very close to the degenerate human surface, where you are uh, you are shrinking the cycles, so you are collapsing the cycles which you used to cut, and so you, this will be your coupling constants. The size, so to speak, the size of the of the circle is going to be or, uh, um, the, the imaginary will correspond to the imaginary part of the corresponding coupling constant. So you already see that the gauge group will have um, as many factors. Uh, simple factors as the number of cuts, right? So then next, you also are allowed to have some punctures, and those punctures will those punctures will be responsible for the matter for the matter content. So there is some there is some combinatorics which enables you to deduce the content of the theory from this kind of pure combinatorial data associated to the generation of the Riemann surface. But the most remarkable fact is that a Riemann surface has many different degenerations, right? So in fact, there is a whole moduli space of Riemann surfaces of a given genus, a given genus so with a given number of punctures. So it's called MGN bar. And so it is going to look something like this. So there is some big moduli space, and then there are some cusps. There are some points which correspond to the generation. What I mean by the generation is you, you collapse this like that. that. And do the same here and here. So this collapsed curve will be one of the cusp points. And so the, the conjecture is that when you compactify the six-dimensional theory, compactify the six-dimensional theory on a, uh, a Riemann surface which is very close to one of those degenerations, you are going to get uh, uh, just uh, the, this gauge theory with this coupling constants and with all this, with all this uh, field content, which there is some rule. But if you do it in a different in a different corner, you will get a totally different description of that same theory. But the, the conjecture is that the theory exists everywhere. So it is a picture which you, uh, is like M theory, which has different degenerations, which you can describe by different types of string theory. Right? So here it's kind of on a smaller scale. You have a whole, the conjecture is that there is a whole family of four dimensional theory, supersymmetric gauge theories in four dimensions, which are parameterized by this moduli space, and maybe some other, some other data. And we have Lagrangian description in some of the corners. And in this, in this corner, the coupling constants appear as just the, more or less, the radii of, of the circles, of the uh, loops um, which we degenerate. And so, in case of if our curve was, was an elliptic curve, this is it's kind of similar, because here you have these two cycles. You have this A cycle, and you have the B cycle. And if you collapse one of them, it corresponds to tau goes to zero. If you collapse the other, it corresponds to tau goes to infinity. Right? And the fact that, but the fact is that the theory is the same, and so you're, you're basically you're, you're considering the same the same theory, but at two different corners. So it is in that sense that considering a more general human surface of genus G gives you a generalization of S duality, because now you actually have more corners, and the statement is that there is something in between which uh, gives you in the limit when you approach each of the corners a particular uh, a gauge theory with a particular Lagrangian description. Now it's time for those who are members of the program. <laughs> so I had a comment and a question. First, you said that we know the theory is non-Lagrangian. I think it would be more accurate to say we don't know if the theory is Lagrangian. Really? I thought there were some arguments. <laughs> there are arguments, but they were similar arguments for the non-abelian M2 brains, okay. which were wrong. So right. I would hesitate on that. Um, then I had a question, which is, suppose you take the practical down-to-earth 
number theorist who works over Z. Okay. Anyone? <laughs> Not here, maybe, but but you know the, the, the number theorist the is just interested in, in you know working yes. in number theory with integers and so yes. on. Has anything from this physical picture fed back and led to real advances in the original Langlands program over Z? It's happening. It's, it's trickling in, you know, slowly because. Uh, it's a long way, as I explained. But I'll give you an example. You know, um, um, for instance, um, I recently wrote a paper with Langlands and Go, in which we uh, we proposed a, a certain approach to proving what's called functoriality conjecture, Langlands functoriality conjecture, um, which is the cornerstone of the Langlands program in number theory. Right? And the, we propose a, cer um, a certain way to tackle this by using what's called the trace formula. And um, this formalism. This formalism uh, that I, I'm talking about, this equivalence of categories of brains, for example, it gives a new perspective on trace formulas. Some, uh, David Benzvi talked about some of this this morning. And uh, it gives us a way to geometrize trace formulas. And so eventually, I, the hope is that one can use geometry to prove these kind of things, which would then eventually feed back to, to the original questions in number theory. I have to say that. So it hasn't happened yet, but it hasn't happened it's very yet. promising that something, some ideas from the physics will really translate back yes, into one the original the, number theory. That's right. So one, I, one, of the, one of the important uh, aspects of this duality between the A model and B model is this Hitchin, uh, Hitchin vibration. In fact, uh, both of these moduli spaces, fiber over vector space, and uh, this, these are two vibrations whose generic fibers are dual toe right? Right, so, but it's, it's, it's an important uh, ingredient. And so, in fact, that has led, for example, us uh, in, in our work to look at the analog of this Hitchin vibration in the context of trace formula. And for example, the fact that it's a vector space is something which people perhaps did not notice before is important because we use, for example, Poisson's summation formula on this, on this analog of the Hitchin base to try to prove some of the results that we need for the functor reality community. So, it, so the benefit could come in different ways. It could come because some of the results, people will see some new methods which would allow to uh, tackle old problems. Or it could be that some objects, studying some objects on the geometric side might give people some inspiration, some ideas to introduce similar objects in a number theory context. But I do believe that eventually this will be very helpful for the development of the classical story. But if Eddie allows me, so uh, Harris and Taylor um, recently uh, extended the modularity theorem uh, to uh, Calabi-Yau manifolds. They would never do it without some support from physics, say, for the ideas essentially from physics. But it's indirect. Again, it is indirect. Some traces can be found in Gerasimov of straight attempts to extend it to arithmetic in Gerasimov papers, but this is not very much convincing uh, so far. That's about it, I believe. Uh -huh. uh, and the largest success in the classical language program in the last several years. And in Go's proof of the fundamental lemma uses ideas that directly fit into the picture that Edward is great. I mean, his proof uses ideas from the geometry. But did this he get it from physics? He didn't get them from physics, he but he, he thought of them himself, right? From, he got them from the geometric context, though. And so there's one step removed to get them get all the way from physics, because we understand the geometric context much better thanks to the physics. But he would have done perfectly well without the physicists. But absolutely, without the absolutely. Physicists. I agree with you. <laughs> right. Stop putting down the physics. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs>